So we'll call the meeting of the Plymouth Planning and Zoning Commission to order, and it is pretty close to seven o'clock. Um, we have really two items on the agenda. The first is approval of the minutes from the April 4th meeting. Would someone like to make a motion that we... A motion to approve. A second? Second. Okay, are there any changes, corrections, anything we need to... Another perfect nope. set. <laughs> they look good to me. All right, so all in favor of approving the minutes of April 4th? Aye. Aye. Okay, so the next item on the agenda is a hearing for the application from Farm and Wilderness for a planned unit development um, on their property in Plymouth, not the property in Mount Holly. And um, we have someone coming in. Ah, oh, he. Ah, ha. <laughs> Don't start without me. No. We we just approved the minutes from the last meeting, which we probably shouldn't have done. Well, you can vote on that, so we were okay. I wasn't that. here, so but, whatever you said is fine. Uh, <laughs> so now you're here. So we do have a quorum, and oh. we are just opening the hearing on. Farm and Wilderness application for plan unit development. And you're chairing it, right? And I'm chairing. And we have one visitor. Could you tell us your name? John Bernard All right. And are you here to speak to this or here to learn? Um, or some of each? Oh, some of each. Okay. Yeah. Well, welcome. Thank you. So I'll turn it over to you, Jay. I'm assuming you have a presentation. I do. Okay. So if uh, this is being recorded, I'm Jay Coleman. I work for the Farm and Wilderness uh, Foundation and Farm and Wilderness Conservation. Uh, I'm also a member of the Planning and Zoning uh, Commission as well, but I'll recu be recusing myself of any deliberation in this matter. Uh, the camps have been around in Plymouth for 83 years, I believe. And um, we not only run summer camps, but we are a conservation organization in the business of stewarding land. Um, we're here because we've um, exceeded the building footprint allowed by our zoning ordinance and um, we'd like to expand for business reasons. Um, the zoning ordinance isn't the only thing that's governing, governing us. We also have uh, Act 250, uh, which is stormwater. Uh, we're also, our buildings are uh, regularly looked at by public safety. Much of our land falls under the Shoreland Protection Act and uh, much of our land uh, is also conserved through the Federal Forest Emergency Program. So uh, Farm and Wilderness, or actually Farm and Wilderness Conservation, is the land holding entity. Um, so we have 4,800 acres, and 3,200 acres of those are permanently conserved. So development rights in those areas have been uh, extinguished. And if you look up above, that's just a, a shot of the zoning map. and. Um, the forest legacy boundary, I'll show you a picture of that shortly, um, but that's very similar to the RD10, which is the yellow section here. The RD5 uh, zoning is in blue, and then we up at the north end of the campus in this orange. Uh, if you can see my pointer, actually, I can probably get a pointer up here. Uh, this is RD2 and a little bit more of um, an operational or industrial area. These are a couple of small parcels that are farm and wilderness property, um, but uh, really aren't the subject of consideration here. And then you can see on the map, we also have, uh, I've outlined a couple things uh, in the pink color. And those are private inholdings um, by uh, the Laughlins, uh, the Webbs, which were the founders of the camp, uh, the Baker family, and also uh, John, who's here this evening, um, is down on the south end as well and has a camp. Um, the entire parcel with the span number in Plymouth is 588 acres, and um, 444 of those are actually conserved. There's a, a drawing of it, but I'm going to actually, that's a, a signed copy just so you can see that those lands that I was talking about that are uh, conserved are actually conserved, and that's uh, been signed by the Commissioner of the Agency of Natural Resources. And um, to explain a little bit, 
better in detail. I think this is a better map for what we're up to. Um, this is the farm and wilderness parcels uh, combined. And the gray area up here is all the conserved land. So the other 120 some acres uh, down here is the subject that we're going to be speaking about tonight. Uh, some of our zoning challenges are um, where the road and the lake come close together. So trying to meet those setbacks. Um, this is another reason we're trying to discuss uh, this planned unit development. We do not wish to, um, uh, but you know, we're not asking for an exception to any setbacks as part of it. But um, you can see sort of the challenge that we have with building. And the land that is up here, I would say that's conserved is largely, um, I would say unsuitable for building in terms of, it's, it'd be possible, but very challenging in terms of wastewater. That's 440 acres? 444 acres, yeah. Uh, I'm going to walk you through uh, what we hope to achieve uh, starting at the north end of the campus and working south. Mm -hmm. um, talking a little bit about four separate areas. And the reason we're asking you all for this, um, this is comprised of three um, lots. And each lot is allowed 5,000 square feet of buildings footprint. Um, and we exceed that by about uh, 72,000 square feet presently because the camps were there before zoning came along. Um, there is a solution to that uh, outside of a PUD and that would be a subdivision into five acre lots, but we don't think that's very reasonable for us, nor is it very reasonable for the town to go through that, that exercise. Um, this seems like a, a much simpler path. Uh, so area one, starting on the north end, we talked about um, adding an office, dormitory, uh, expanding year-round staff housing. Our day camp is located in that area, and uh, we talked about adding a commercial kitchen. One thing to note is that we've really been working hard to make sure our wastewater systems are in good condition. Uh, we've replaced some over time. We have uh, a new one in design that should be installed in the, in the fall. And uh, we have all those serviced on a regular basis. And we, have, we can provide records if people were actually interested in that aspect. But we're good stewards of our wastewater systems. Uh, and so when I talked about an area with maybe an office or a dorm, um, this building over on the left is existing. And again, this is the RD2 district. This was a plan we had for our main uh, office, but since uh, the pandemic, that's kind of been scrapped. Um, but over here, we're thinking possibly a dormitory or maybe even staff housing. And this is our day camp and presently our, our current main office, which is a 1970s farmhouse. Um, so we think uh, we've asked for square footage in this to accommodate for a few of these things, staff housing, uh, the office. And as you can see, uh, we've generally tried to keep uh, vegetated buffers in places not clear putting. Um, I should have probably brought up a uh, shot of our mate, the uh, maintenance building over here. We tried to conceal the entrance to that. And in fact, you can see the solar field behind it, which uh, we've really done a good job, I think, of keeping that out of sight from view. So um, mm -hmm. we try not to make that in a, what I would call it, an offensive installation. Mm -hmm. so you can... Okay, where's the current entrance? So the current entrance would be down here. That's it, yeah. uh, okay. And the reservoir would be to the right. Jay, on, yeah. on your solar field, yeah. that array, yep. are they tracking or are they permanently? They're fixed, they're permanently yeah. fixed, yep. yep. And between that, if you're curious, between that and our farmhouse install uh, provides about 100,000 kilowatt hours of electricity, which is our entire campus's needs. Mm. So, mm. It's provided just a tremendous cost savings actually over time. Um, but I guess I'm getting off subject a little bit. Uh, so this is a conceptual drawing for staff housing. Um, <clears throat> staff housing is pretty important to us. Uh, last year, Vermont was third in the nation for migration into the state. It is the it has the lowest vacancy rate in the nation for rental housing. Um, if we hire somebody, it is hard to get them in this area. Um, and we are, we are in the, uh, our business requires a lot of employees. In fact, payroll is um, over half of our uh, annual budget. 
uh, area two, which I would call our Timberlake campus, primarily RD5. We'd like to expand some dining hall capacity, maybe some camper uh, cabin capacity, and possibly an activity building. Um, often our activity buildings have electricity and sometimes wastewater, and those are you know fully permitted as well. And just as an example, um, this was a cabin. Uh, because we could not build this year, we got a uh, temporary permit. And in theory, we may have to destruct, deconstruct this at the end of the summer, but it's a significant uh, amount of effort to even build a temporary cabin. And you can see it's got precast footings, um, a timber frame, um, and, you know, theoretically, we may have to actually dismantle that. But um, just to illustrate how we try to keep a lot of our buildings out of view, if you kind of look, there's the old, some older cabins around it and the newer cabin in the background. And when you look at it, um, from South End Road, that's a shot from the road. You can almost not even see that there's a, a new cabin in there mm -hmm. other than the uh, little bit of uh, light color in this area. Mm -hmm. uh, in Area 3, heading south along the lake, um, we thought this is possibly an alternate location for a dormitory if we were to build one. It's not as likely. Um, a challenge would be parking in that area. Um, we generally have all our staff park on that north end of campus. It's just, it's an old road. It's got both side on each side. It's not conducive to adding a lot of parking. Um, staff run around in golf carts, you know, most of the summer that's pretty adequate for us. Um, so if, if parking were increased, um, this, is, this is probably not a great place for it. So that's probably why in that area one. But we did not want to rule it out. We, needed, we did want some flexibility. If I, so if I was presenting this, I wanted to be transparent that it, it's a possibility. Um, again, some seasonal cabins maybe, uh, the year-round cabins. Um, we don't, if we want to run a program, we don't have enough uh, capacity in the off-season to house people. So once it starts getting cold and the water starts to you know, freeze in October, it's like we're, we're pretty much done. We won't, we won't do any other activities. And that's a real challenge for the entire summer camp business. You can't just make it run in summer camp anymore. You need to partner with schools, educational institutions, and be doing other things. And part of that means we can take our business to them, but we're limited about how much business we can bring to us. Uh, that is there heat in any of those cabins, or is it just uh, sleeping no. bags? No, it's pretty much the three-sided, generally speaking. Uh, kids sleep in sleeping bags. They have bug nets. Um, but in the, you don't go in the other in the shoulder seasons or towards the winter. You yeah. just don't use them. Yeah, we just shut those down. Yeah, we have uh, water. We have outdoor shower houses. Those get shut down. In the right. Houses. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, everything pretty much gets shut down for the season outside of the farm. Um, not how anticipate anticipating that picture to look, um, but. Just to show, we do keep everything pretty well forested. Um, if you uh, go along the lake, you, you in the, especially in the summertime when the foliage is on the trees, you don't really notice the cabins. Uh, heading north again, area four, also in the RD5 district. Um, we'd like to expand some kitchen uh, capacity at this camp. That's called Firefly Song. Uh, some cabin capacity. And we have a new activity building uh, that we'd like to replace with a larger one. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is a conceptual drawing of what we're proposing. Um, we actually con constructed, this is a barn, and we actually constructed that same exact footprint up on a hill. Uh, it's an activity area that they use for um, milking goats, um, you know, um, cleaning up beans, uh, you know, working on wool, projects like that. Um, and in the building that we're talking about um, in this previous drawing, that's something like we would propose. Pretty rusted, um, you know, ship flat siding often from uh, trees that have come off the land, and you know, green metal roofing that kind of that blends in with the environment. Uh, how big is that building? Uh, that one is about uh, just around 800 square feet. Oh. And is that what you're contemplating? Something of that size? That's like the, that's the perfect size and scale for you know 
20 kids. Maybe yeah. they, you know, especially on a rainy day, uh, those spaces are kind of hard for us to come by, you know, to run activities. Um, so they're real helpful. And that's, that really meets our, a building that size for an activity area it just meets our needs perfectly at this point. And that's the building that would be replaced, and you can see that that's uh, mm. lived long beyond its useful <laughs> life. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not very helpful for us to run a good program. And in fact, you know, um, young people today, when we're trying to recruit them, it takes a little bit more um, to get them interested in the job, and sometimes a little bit nicer facility can, can help us do that. Again, another, uh, this is a photo I really wanted to show you all. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment and fix it if I can. It demonstrates um, what the lake shore looks like. It still doesn't show up well. Well, um, well yeah. there yeah, you go. So that's, if you look down, uh, and this starts pretty close to where John's camp is located, if you follow that shoreline down and around the peninsula, it's probably close to a mile and a half, and it really looks like undeveloped shoreline. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the area, I mean, really where the greatest density of development that we've already completed. Um, so when you're driving down Route 100, you might see a, a little barn up on the hillside. But if you're driving by, I mean, there's almost there's 220 roof structures on that property. And you just don't see them. So I just want to say that that is the um, that's something that we take into consideration when we develop things. We're paying attention to the Shoreland uh, Development Act, so we're not clearing vegetation. And um, it, we also find that the people that come to the camps, like that's what they're looking for. So. Um, that is our plan uh, going forward. Um, so do you have questions for me? What's the timeline for all that? It's, you know, a lot of it's a function of money. And, and I can say that, you know, um, we, we don't have the money to uh, <laughs> build out what, you know, we're talking about here. Um, so we would build pieces of it depending on priorities. You know, I think in this application, uh, I requested 20,000 square feet. Um, but I think staff housing is probably one of our biggest priorities right now. So that would be uh, a couple duplexes. Definitely would like to build the activity building, which is 800 square feet plus or minus uh, in the next maybe year. Um, and then the cabins, um, that's probably like a, a three year timeline for some additional cabins. And, um, you know, especially at the one place where I showed you where the road kind of chokes down uh, with the lake, you know, we probably get maybe one, possibly two cabins there at the most. There's just not a lot of room based on setbacks. Um, so I'd say even though this is probably a larger ask, um, our plan isn't firm. And um, we requested this over 10 years. And uh, really, it's a function of money and also a function of trust. Um, some of this, it, we just might find that our, we're probably not going to build an office and a um, dormitory. I mean, that just expense-wise, building construction costs around four hundred fifty dollars a square foot these days. And so, you know, a million dollars is not very far. Okay. Yeah. As you know, somebody comes for a, a permit and it's granted. Generally, there's a time frame in, involved. And you're you're looking to extend it to ten years, uh, and it's 
There's a lot of things there, and I understand about the money. My question is, is 10 years enough, or would you like to have this for a longer period of time since you're here for an approval? Uh, I can't recall what the limitation is. The, the um, <clears throat> HUD procedures is a four-year thing with the option of extending it um, beyond that after or up to the before you've reached the full four years you can apply for an extension so it doesn't limit the number of extensions okay. at least that in reading it i haven't figured that out but um you we could fix a period for extension that would be really at helpful. the time you did that that's, so that <clears throat> that's in Five three seven here. Um, Should we follow the letter of the law there and grant a four year, and then grant a you have extensions? You can come in and apply for extensions. Yeah, we'd have to order to come in and extend it every every four years. So I, I don't, you know, it'd be great if we could do that. Well, then you could sort of keep the commission up to date on what you've been able to do and what you still hope to do. And if there's any changes, changes, you can make the, you can make some changes. This seems to be fairly flexible. Um, the and commission. Correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, I, I believe we still need to come in building permits, conditional yes. use in, in certain cases, right? Yep. The bottom is still going to be conditional use. For the individual structures, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, but you 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 would kind of eliminate the overhanging problem of not having the appropriate square footage on each little piece of property. That, if we accept this, as I understand it, we kind of take care of that issue. I mean, most of it's, I hate to use the phrase grandfathered, but it was there before we had a zoning ordinance, so... And that's really the limitation that we've been trying to mm -hmm. overcome with this. It seems like the path forward to us. That makes a lot of sense. And being a single owner of a whole bunch of stuff, a lot of the pieces in the planned unit development part of the zoning don't necessarily apply, like having to have an association of the various property owners and all that stuff. You, you were it. But this one, this um, thing on the time limit says we could limit the period of approval for a specific time period within which substantial construction shall commence, such period not to be in excess of four years. Now, substantial is one of those airy words that for you guys getting moving, I would say, is something it's it's not like you're going to be building a whole bunch of like housing housing. <coughs> yeah housing and activity areas mm. i think are probably the priority in a couple of cabins mm -hmm. um, you know uh and, and you know like the perfect example uh and i you know we were going to build a main office um didn't foresee that remote work would become such a, a big thing with the pandemic and we canceled that, that job so so things change over time like mm -hmm. this you know and um but I, th I think this is, we feel like we have general direction of where we're heading mm -hmm. with this. And, and if we're still in the summer camp business, then what we've kind of proposed here, I think, makes a lot of sense. With, with all these different mini projects that you have lined up, do you have uh, a sense of where you might want to begin? Yeah, the, the one, um, the first thing I'm, I'd like to do with this is I, I'd like to get a building permit in for that cabin that we built as temporary. I'd love to have that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a, turned out to be a beautiful little project. It, it's exactly what we need. Um, and I, I hate to de, you know, I mean, if we have to deconstruct it, we will, but I'd love that too. Um, the activity building that I showed you, that that's a pretty high priority for us. Um, and then we're just kind of weighing out other options with commercial kitchen, um, in the staff housing, like where do we need to invest? Like what's the priority? And we're kind of walking through that with our board because it's, you know, like, I'm not a decision maker for the organization as a single person or, or neither, neither is my boss. A lot of that is, is board driven. They're making sure we're, you know, doing our um, 
research and diligence about what is needed and then how we're going to fund it. So, it's a, of course, to actually build something hard, it's a, it's a process. Mm. But having this would allow you to do that planning, knowing that you're not spinning your wheels unnecessarily for something that we wouldn't. Yeah, and we, you know, when we were going to do the Friends Lodge, we called it Friends Lodge, which was the office building, I thought at the time the only way for us to do that was a, a two acre subdivision out of the property. And I don't know how well that serves the town, I don't know how well that serves the listers, mm -hmm. I don't know how well that serves us. Um, just going to subdivide every time you want to build something, it seems kind of. Sounds overly like complex. Yeah, and we do the same thing, right? We come in for a subdivision hearing, and the next thing you know, you know, we've got instead of three or four parcels, we could have thirty parcels. And I don't think, uh, yeah, it just doesn't. This seems kind of awkward. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's an old timey way of trying to build stuff. I mean, a lot of cities are in deep trouble for. But we're trying to avoid that. Suburbs, like, yeah. For making people have to create little fractions of property and not allowing them to do it because the zoning doesn't let it happen. So you can't house people. And that's a piece of your dilemma. Jay, I have to ask this question. Yeah. Short term rentals, are those two um, are those two guests, staff members and campers? <clears throat> So short-term rentals, we uh, in the off season, we off we will do that sometimes just to supplemental income to people, general public. We'll do a little bit to the general public. Yeah, a lot of it is um, the big facilities. Those are rarely used as short-term rentals. That's more like a group wants to come in. We do weddings, um, host uh, educational things. Like two weeks ago, we had um, the. Um, Vermont foresters, some of them were state foresters, some of them were um, consulting foresters to talk about the new land use regulations, uh, which is uh, not conservation current use, but the um, reserve current use, which right. doesn't require forestry practices. Right. So, I mean, we get like these groups that are do similar things that want to come in, have a you know day long or two day long retreat and we run a facility. So when you say an increase in camper and staff cabin capacity, that would be limited to campers and staff and not the general public? There's, is there any intention of you? I, what I'm getting at on all this is just, yeah, yeah. is there any intention to branch out and have this as a facility for non-campers and general public? Yeah, really outside of what we do with, the, with, like with these, so with the, say if we constructed a dormitory, we might view that differently. Um, but when we're talking about the camp facilities with the commercial kitchen and all these three-sided cabins, that's like a very particular kind of customer, um, you know, and so that's not like a, a, a short-term. It's an institutional yeah. thing, yeah. But if we have an apart, we have a duplex on the property, and we have rented that out as a short-term rental in the past. We haven't done it uh, in the last three years, maybe because um, the pandemic happened, housing shortage. Uh, so we needed to use every resource just to run our business. But um, if we have vacancies, I could see us, um, you know, signing up for the short-term rental program here in town and supplementing our income during ski season. Yeah. And we've done that in the past. Because those would be heated buildings. Or, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So now the, the, the bigger buildings on the north end, yes. are they going to be, with relation to what you have now, are they about the same size or are you planning on going much larger yeah so i think um generally building square footage is limited to five thousand square feet regardless like you know the, the actual size of the footprint so, and that's my interpretation of the no, story that's so you, correct so you could have a ten thousand square foot building and that would be a significant mass if it was two-story right mm -hmm. you know and i think and that would become under conditional use review uh as a step Right, that this wouldn't give us carte blanche to do something like that. It just gives us a square foot. Well, that's what I was thinking of. Some assurance that you're not going to be building a building that's just out of proportion to the area. Yeah. And, you know, I think what, I don't know what that size is, but I'm just saying, uh, and, and I'm sure it's not even your intention right now, but I think there should be some protection that there's not a massive three story you know, that, building. This, it seems this to me the permission the, 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 I'm sorry. Oh go ahead. Seems to me the protections are built in because yeah. anytime you want to start any 
project within the PUD, it has it to come up back. for approval. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's okay, automatic. So at this time, this yeah, time. we're not, we're not telling them now. You can build condominiums, you know, <laughs> right. with underground parking. Mm -hmm. That that has to happen. Okay. As it happens, my question would be: if if you're you're here now seeking approval for a PUD, there is a condition, as far as I read, it, that significant construction must begin within the first four years. Yeah. And if it doesn't happen, I'm reading in 5.3.12, the PUD can be considered to be canceled. Am yeah. I am I missing something or is no, that? It's a risk. I think we'd have to reapply. Or, I don't know, extending yeah. is, a, is a possibility. But as long as... And and again, there's no definition in here on what is what significant. What substantial means? Yeah. Is yeah. There? You no. said you're going to be building. So, right no, off the so as long as you, yeah. so as long as you start count. some project within the first four years, it would seem to me, at any rate, that you're within compliance. Would you, but, if, if you uh, vote for the plug, would would you put that in the decision letter with that? I, I think it's already in the regulations. I don't think we have to state what's already regulated. I, I'm just bringing it up. Yeah. I, I'm sure you're aware of it. I know you, and you're not going to miss yeah. anything here. But and, and to launch a big project, you know, I mean, that'll take us years. By the time you know, design, permitting, uh, public safety, meeting all those requirements, septic. I mean, it takes us about a year to get a septic system design if it's not just a little residential one so um and by the time you know we figure out that we like what we have and are ready to go i mean it's probably two to three years before we're ready to even launch and then if we could even get a, a contractor right now as those smaller buildings um like the activity building that i was showing you that's probably those are no problem but something bigger is going to be a process for us so but you're probably going to be doing something of significance within the first four years. Yeah, the, the activity building would probably be the biggest one. Yeah. And then I think we may start on staff housing. That would be my yeah. guess. And I call that significant based on today's prices. Yeah. Well, it is. Sure, Absolutely. it is. Well, substantial is the word in the ordinance, but yeah, substantial. Um, I think that is, and we might put something in the decision letter that would kind of clarify this a little bit because that's their thinking in terms of a PUD for somebody who wanted to take, we'll say something like Round Top or Bear Creek or whatever we call it, and build a bunch of condos and consolidate development on one piece of the property, which our zoning ordinance wouldn't allow short of a PUD. That's, a, that's where you talk about substantial construction. If you get permission to do all of that and then nothing happens, that's where, that's what this is written for. It's mm -hmm. not written for the kind of thing that you're talking about doing. I was confused. <laughs> I think, but yeah, I think it, would, it would help us to say something. I don't think the zoning in a decision to consider kind of like the operation that we run. Here. No. Yeah. no it but it's a good question. Well, thank you. <laughs> What's more yeah. intended to deter sprawl, right? Right, exactly. And you're not in the business <clears throat> of sprawl, so it's kind of we're using a, you know, you just kind of modifying it for you, right? Yeah, that's what I think I see it. Anybody have any more questions? Do you have anything you'd like to add to the discussion? I just have a, I just have a little dissertation that I'd like to read if you'd like <laughs> to have Sure. Uh, it's, uh, I, I thank you for the chance to speak to the board. Um, so uh, I just kind of wrote this um, to talk a little bit about what where my family and I um, stand on Woodward Reservoir and the Farmer Wilderness Foundation, and the way things operate. So, 
So what I wrote here is, uh, so I received a notice <coughs> informing me of the hearing for Farmer and Foundation. But I decided to come to the meeting to testify or to explain my thoughts. Uh, my father built our family camp in the late 50s. And ever since, we've been fortunate to have property on Woodward Reservoir. The reservoir is a great place to, is a great lake and a great place to spend time. And I'm here tonight to support the Farm Wilderness Foundation. I believe the Farm Wilderness Foundation should be able to continue to grow in the same responsible way. I believe the Fire and Wilderness Foundation is great for Woodward Reservoir, the town of Plymouth, and the state of Vermont. They employ local people. They are very good stewards of the land. So just to be clear, I'm here tonight to support the expansion of the Fire and Wilderness square footage rule to allow their continued growth in our community. Um, I can add to this a little bit after seeing what Jay provided for us. Um, the square footage rule is, is only in one part of, of their land. And you can see how much conservancy has been put forth by farmer wilderness as they as they continue to to um, acquire land for their conservancy um, side of the business. In other words, similar to like Peggy's Pond area and those things. And, and when they do that, they work with the state of Vermont on on water quality issues that really don't have anything to do with development. They have to do with maybe what somebody did years ago and to mitigate any risk or issues um, with that. Um, so so I, my father has worked with the Farm and Wilderness years ago when um, the, the dam was put in. Um, he looked at the lake as a unique area and helped pass a bill in Montpelier to support uh, five miles an hour no wake um, zone, you know, as far as the lake goes, which is great for fishing. It's great for recreating in all kinds of different ways. Um, and that anybody that wants to water ski is certainly welcome to go six miles down the road to the Ludlow Lakes, and, and they're very suitable for that. So. So I, I applaud the foundation for doing what they do to conserve property and, and to build responsibly. And so, so that's why I'm here tonight. I, I think it's, they're, they're great neighbors for my family and I. They're great neighbors for everybody else on the lake. And as you can see, I think that's why there's nobody here tonight. Mm. So. That's, that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. And thanks well, for thanks coming. Thanks for coming, yeah. We appreciate people coming. Yeah. <clears throat> it helps us when people come and share their own points of view, regardless of what way they're coming from. But I think just speaking personally, people very often don't get out of their own way to say positive things. So that was really nice. Well, uh, it's an amazing place to have a camp. Being with the, with the foundation so close and owning so much property, and it fits my lifestyle because I'm a fisherman. So I have to go 2.1 to 1.7 miles an hour around the lake to to drag a lure and that works works for <laughs> way under the five mile an hour. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. So are we all? I'm good. Ready to move Wait, what's into the alternative to doing that? Just plodding along and making mm -hmm. nothing. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're gonna have, we, we'll probably we have some needs that we have to meet, right? And then uh, the only way forward for us is then to do subdivide. <laughs> and we don't want to do them. Um, it's just a huge hassle. And um, I, I don't know if we want to put ourselves through that or if we want to put the town through that. Um, so I think, yeah, I think, it, you know, if it, this was uh, turned down, I, I think this would, this is definitely, uh, will have an impact on our business. Uh, and the affirmation of this is very helpful to what we're trying to do, you know? And uh, so I think we had to subdivide and only do we absolutely felt that we, needed. of course, I think that's true with this too. So I, I don't know if there's a distinction there, but. Yeah, this certainly makes it easier. And I, I think it also, uh, if this is approved, it, it, it kind of gives us um, the sense that the board thinks we're on the right track, right? And um, I think we, you know, we want that from not only the board, but the community as well. Um, you know, we're, we don't want to irritate our, our neighbors and people in town if we can and help it. And so a positive, um, an affirmation of this plan, it, it just really helps us, you know, I think proceed with a little bit of confidence. Mm -hmm. In a non-adversarial way. That's... Anybody have anything else? Since we do have a quorum, we could proceed to discussing what we want to do. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, thank, thank you, you for coming.